I farm here with my brothers and sisters, it's five of us. My father in 2011 decided to turn this farm over to us. But I'm gonna start with our journey because our journey started back in early 1919 with my grandfather on my mother's side. Both farming is in my genes from paternal and maternal side. You know, it's pretty powerful to know that our parents, grandparents of mixed descent was able to acquire the land that they did during their journey and to be able to say that their grandkids now are now taking it and moving it to another. I mean, we're now, we're third generation on both sides and we are the only family that's farming on my mother's side. Um, but on my dad's side, I have other brothers and, and cousins that farm, but it's pretty powerful to know that to be able to acquire, my grandfather farmed 147 acres, we share cropped over a thousand. My grandfather on my dad's side farmed over 500 acres. He was a contractor, third grade education, but was a very resilient man and a servant leader in the community. Big pillar, both my grandparents in the community. Um, you know, my grandfather on my mother's side really thought, saw the value of education and the value of supporting his children. He built his schoolhouse for his 12 children to go to school. So when my father turned a farm over to us in 2011, uh, one of the things that we had to do is to think about, it can no longer operate in the way that he operated it if we wanted to look at uh, sustainability and scalability. So one of the things we looked at uh, was looking at an asset map to look at the current assets in which we had in order for us to move it to another level. One thing we did have to address was infrastructure. We did not have the current infrastructure that we currently have now. We're continuing to improve in that, but infrastructure is so important for sustainability of farms, also diversification. And one of the things that we did is we looked at, we had beef cattle, we had you know land, we had a homestead. So this, we just looked at it and said, current assets, how can we convert them into additional profit? So that's when we converted the homestead into an Airbnb, which is named before my mother and father, um, named after them. And then we also have, we took, went to a value added side with the meat. Um, and then of course I grew up and my first project was, was uh, pork or swine. And then we reintroduced swine back to the farm. So we now have value added with our uh, beef products, our pork products, and then also our berry production. So we sell at local farmers markets. We have about three farmers markets that we sell to. We do direct sales to specific clients that come straight to the farm to buy off the farm. We do have an on-farm farm stand that we sell. We do some direct marketing. And then of course we sell wholesale too. So, um, and we have several uh, food hubs that we sell to. So we, um, you know, 4P Foods has been a good partner. Seasonal Roots has been a good partner. And then we just have you know, some small churches have now um, become clients of ours. And then we also have regular day-to-day -day people that'll stop by uh, that want specific cuts. And so we do try to be customer focused and customer oriented about whatever they need we want to be able to provide to them. So it has really worked out to us. And we've added the, the value added. We've started doing uh, integrating some of our flowers into our jelly. So we do a rose petal jelly. Um, we do some mint jelly. So we do a lot of different things and playing with a lot of the the native things on our farm. COVID really put small farms back on the map. Uh, when I was listening to several of my friends and other acquaintances around the community, people were really concerned that big box stores was limiting what they could purchase out of the grocery store, which was very bothersome to many people. And I said, I tell you, it's so important that if you don't have a relationship with a local producer or farmer, you need to establish one because you will never be without food. Uh, our civic responsibility here at Cattle Run Farm, you know, we are all servant leaders. We, we grew up with servant leaders in our life and the civic responsibility of using the farm to build community, but also we're using this farm as also an educational and technical training tool where we are providing poultry processing training, we are providing pork processing training, we're, you know, teaching folks how to come out and, you know, establish raised bed building or construction or looking at different mediums for growing their food. And so people think you gotta have 50 acres to be a successful farmer. Well, if you have five acres and you have a planogram in your mind on how you can feed your community on that five acres, it could be just as powerful as someone raising it off of 500 acres, right? And so really having 
having that teaching ability to, to show people different strategies. When people come here, they look at this farm as, oh my God, it's so, it, you know, you guys have it going on. Well, it didn't always look like this, right? And so there's a lot of trial and error in this space. And creating an ecosystem designed to exude community is pretty important for us. So uh, Ralph and I and uh, several other farmers were founding members of the Minority Veteran Farmers of the Piedmont, which is an organization to help really um, support small farms and helping them to really look at how do you diversify, how do you serve different. So I also serve on the Piedmont Action Coalition on Hunger and the Regional Workforce Director. So I thread all that through to create my ecosystem around the agrarian world, around the food resiliency piece. Food resiliency right now has, is bigger than it ever has been due to inflation and people can't afford, food costs are so expensive. I've seen our middle class have to lean on the food banks and food closets and pantries. And I said, and that's not a bad thing. And I'm trying to help people to debunk the myth that food banks are for poor people. And I saw there's a lot of inequities in our food bank, in our food system, that we have to shift if we're going to look at the equity lens in the right perspective, right? You know, people are using diversity, equity, and inclusion since the George Floyd era. You know, people have taken that, that acronym and just blown it out of proportion, but do we really understand what it means? And when I look at it from a food lens, I don't see color. I'm looking at opportunities for all, equal access for all. And so if I'm gonna eat steak or if I'm gonna eat quality hamburger, I want them to have quality hamburger. So we started this food resiliency program through the Minority Veteran Farmers of the Piedmont to support not only the food banks, but also support another market for our small farmers. And so we have been donating food to several different food banks across this region. We solely have been focusing in on the Northern Piedmont, but we're now looking to move to the Southern Piedmont so we can address this whole scale. But food equity is so important, and specifically on a protein side, because a lot of food banks don't get a lot of protein because it is expensive. But we found a way to write grants and go after some additional funding to support the food resiliency program so that all communities can have access to fresh and healthy foods that are grown locally. So we have been approached to look at using our farm as a food hub, which is basically um, a, a site where producers can bring their product here and then we source it out to food pantries, specifically to those individuals who are not receiving federal food. But example, the churches that we're serving in this region, either they will come and pick up their food from this site or we will deliver it to them uh, wherever their need is. So really being a collective uh, system, an ecosystem for food, specifically protein, because that's what we're focusing on, eggs and protein. And then we push it out to our surrounding food pantries and food banks and closets in our region so that we can support the food uh, resiliency programs where people are having difficulty uh, making their ends meet. You know, when my father turned the farm over to us in 2011, he was not a big advocate for USDA programs because of the historical lens and minority farmers in USDA, that relationship. And he just said, I don't want to do welfare farming. That's what he saw USDA as, welfare farming. And that was his, you know, definition of it, right? While there are supplements out here to support farmers uh, with, you know, stream exclusion, rotational grazing, regenerative ag practices, we've gotten into several things. We have a lot of wildlife here. We have a lot of deer, rabbits, we have a lot of, we have coyotes here, we have a lot. And so we are here to foster, continue to be fostering the, the steward, land stewardship. So we have several different things. We have our pasture raised pork, which is used for grazing our, our wooded areas to clean up all of that land clearing. Um, we do have the, our waterways fenced off. We have rotational grazing program with our beef. We have chicken tractors with our chicken poultry program. We also have mortality composting, what we use. We're also in another land stewardship with native grasses and with birds and, you know, trying to attract more of the native birds here to support this initiative. So it is about our story. It is about telling the story about where we started and where we came from and where we are. You know, I, American Farmland Trust asked me to do a story on them with Women in the Land. I was their first recipient to receive that grant and that award this year, which is pretty powerful. I celebrate that award for all women in the agrarian industry. 
And I did acknowledge that this is not just for me, but it's for every woman because one of the things I told in that story is that the land doesn't judge and it definitely doesn't judge women. It doesn't look at us and say, oh, you're too fat, oh, you're too big, oh, you're too skinny. But we as women, we understand what is the power of the dirt for us because we can put our children on our back or our stomachs and go out and work the land and also allow our children to become grounded in the dirt. And so reconnecting with the soil medium and really reconnecting with the land is pretty powerful for a woman, specifically in the many changes she has to go through in her life. The agrarian industry really does, it's a great tool for mental health because women go through so much from depression, whether they're a young mother, a young missy, or postpartum and you know going into aging and menopause, it's so important for us to understand our connection to the dirt and the land. And when our women back in slavery, um, they would take their babies that was on their backs out and lay them in the troughs and they'd go miles to harvest cotton or whatever, and they'd come back, and if a storm came, their babies floated on away. And the power of the land really helped them get through that because they knew that the fruits of their labor, they had to sacrifice. And so when you make those sacrifices as a woman, it's rewarding when you see the fruits of your labor, whether it be your berries, your flowers, or whatever, it's pretty powerful. Uh, you know, we, we fix this farm so that it can never be sold, never be commercialized. Um, we are right on a main thoroughfare. I would like to see the next generation take it and move it to a totally different level, uh, whether it becomes a part of a learning lab with a, a, a one of our uh, land-grant institutions or to be a some sort of contractor with the land-grant institutions. Ideally, I would love for us to have use it as a, a hub to teach young uh, aspiring agrarians to come and do internships, to do externships, cooperatives, so that they truly can understand it. It's one thing to learn it out of a textbook. To actually apply it is totally different. We've hosted some, um, my uncles, they, you know, we do still castrate our animals, and so we've hosted several of the students from VSU up here to teach them how to do that. Um, we've had some vaccination classes up here. But, you know, really looking at it as a learning lab in the, in the future for people to come and, and also to have the on-farm store and just really get into the whole agritourism a little bit more. But it takes a lot of time to commit to agritourism. It's a lot. You know, I use this analogy a lot. Agriculture is not cows, sows, and plows. It's bigger than that, right? Agriculture is everything from who's the next, who's the next person that's gonna market? Who's gonna be the next uh, videographer to come out and say, or filmographer or producer that says, we wanna do the next Yellowstone, but do it in Virginia, right? Uh, or, you know, it's, it's law, it's policy, it's everything, right? And so people have so many mis misconceptions about the agrarian industry. And there are a lot of people who don't know that Virginia's ag industry is the largest in our state, right? $105 billion industry. People don't know that. And so when we talk about it, they're like, oh my God, I didn't know. Like, they want to put these sophisticated, like, processing is now in light food and beverage manufacturing. You know, it's like, it's processing for us, right? I want people to know it's workforce. My biggest concern right now are what are we going to do to train the next generation of agrarian workers? Who's going to, and how are we going to encourage farmers who don't have children who want to, to expand their legacy? How do we say, but don't sell it? Let's, let's establish some sort of renting program or share program so young people can get into that and say, well, we will buy into that. And you come up with a fair market value that that person has to pay you each month, but you be the person that's financing it to someone as opposed to building houses. We, the more we grow houses, the more people are gonna be eating out of Petri dishes. I think the agrarian space and the value for one, respect for the land, but respect for ourselves, but also respect to our community, and that's where our servant leadership comes in. But it's all about paying it forward and giving back, and that's what we see our farm as a learning lab to do that. <laughs>